As I started to pull together my thoughts for this second Teddy Talk, I couldn't help but think a bit on the first one back in July that I called Now What? In that talk, I made a connection to the story Be the First Penguin by Randy Pausch, encouraging principals to step into a lead learner role as a way of moving teachers and students forward in these unprecedented times. I talked about intentionality and commitment and taking risk and the possibility of failure and not getting it perfect or exactly as we wanted. Breaking out of old routines, deviating from the norm, all the while knowing that clear potential for failure is there, albeit failure that produces new learning. This has become even more important in the last two months. I also shared a quote by Michael Fullen that said, strong principles see new learning as the norm. They know that you can't lead without learning and they seek breakthroughs by mobilizing these capacity in other people. Well, here we are. The start of the feared unprecedented school year is actually here. Students, teachers, staff, administrators, have all returned to school in a wide variety of settings that include face-to-face -face and physical buildings, virtual platforms, and a wide variety of hybrid options. So much has changed from the way schools looked and operated in March of last school year. These changes include things like health and safety protocols, bus pickup and drop-off procedures, instructional delivery methods and platforms, planning procedures, virtual instruction resources, parent drop-off and pickup procedures, student engagement strategies, teacher observations and evaluations and conferencing procedures, as well as planning, delivery, and participation in professional development. Just listing the changes is exhausting. Yet amidst all the many changes, one thing has not changed. And that is that school principals are still charged with supporting and growing teachers in order to increase student achievement. This unchanged charge and the responsibility of school leaders led me to the focus for this second Teddy Talk. I'm calling it Maintaining Purpose in New Circumstances. Because of our new special situation, district schools, administrators, and teachers across the country are quickly realizing that our traditional tools, processes, and resources will likely not be as effective under this new set of circumstances. New tools and resources are being brought in. And as I heard one teacher say just last week, there's so much to learn. Here again, principals need to be the lead learner in their building, consistently work to build capacity of their teachers to appropriately use these new tools and resources while measuring their impact on both teaching and learning. Reflecting on this brought to mind a story that I'd like to share with you. It's called Once Upon McDonald's Farm by Stephen Gamel. And it goes like this. While it's true that McDonald had a farm, it wasn't much of a farm at all. As a matter of fact, in the beginning, he had no animals, none at all. He told himself one night, I really must get myself some animals. So he went out the next day and bought an elephant, a baboon, and a lion. And he was proud of his new animals. So the next day in the morning, McDonald and the elephant went out into the field to do the plowing. And much, much later that afternoon, McDonald realized he had other chores to do. Of course, there was eggs to gather. And also, there was milking to do. At the end of the day, McDonald was really tired and very weary from a hard day. So he went to bed early. But while he was asleep, the animals decided they had had enough. And so they decided to leave. And so they did without a sound. When McDonald awoke, he realized he had no animals. But his neighbor offered to help. Later that evening, he sent over a horse, a cow, and a chicken. Now, McDonald was really thankful for his new animals. So after a good night's sleep and a healthy breakfast, McDonald was eager to go to work. 
Of course, he had eggs to gather and the milking to do. But first, of course, he had to do the plowing. Reflecting on this story, it becomes evident that to be a successful farmer, McDonald knew that he needed animals for his farm. So he went out and bought what he thought he needed, an elephant to plow with and a lion and a baboon for milking and producing eggs. This, of course, didn't work and led to frustration on the part of both McDonald and the animals, causing the animals to leave. Faced with a new set of circumstances, McDonald gets help from his neighbor who provided him with new animals, a horse, a cow, and a chicken. McDonald's appreciation of the neighbor's gift was short-lived, though, as he adjusted his plan, returned to work early the next day, attempting to plow the field with the chicken. We are facing times and circumstances unlike any in the past. Moving forward effectively is certainly requiring schools, administrators, and teachers to have the right set of tools processes, protocols, and strategies to maneuver through these uncharted waters. But while I believe making those tools available is critical, the availability of the tools is not enough. District and building level administrators need to go a step further and embrace their own responsibility to build capacity of their teachers, the staff, and themselves to ensure the most appropriate, effective, and meaningful use of those tools, and that how those tools are being used has an impact on classroom instruction and student learning. In other words, we don't want folks plowing with the chicken. And that's kind of what I want to talk to you about today. We must stop and ask ourselves, who are our education farmers? And what can we do to support their work? The way I see it, we have superintendents and district leaders who grow principals, principals and assistant principals who grow teachers, and teachers who grow students. Research clearly shows that effective principals work to build capacity of teachers through the use of reflection and collaborative practices. Without reflection, there can be no growth. As noted by Pete Hall in his book, Creating a Culture of Reflective Practice, the key to increasing our impact, to raising student achievement, lies in our ability to engage in frequent, accurate, and deep self-reflection. And this is true for the virtual setting, face-to-face -face teaching and learning, or any combination. In order for a principal to build capacity in others, he or she must first be skillful in their own reflective practices, especially in regards to the new sets of tools resources and processes, as well as teaching strategies that are necessary for our students to be successful this school year. Principals will have to be the lead learners in this area and provide structured, collaborative opportunities for teachers to learn and grow together. According to the NIT Principal Standard Rubric, effective principals strengthen teacher instructional capacity and increase impact on student learning when they, one, ensure collaborative opportunities for teachers to use student learning evidence to make instructional adjustments. Secondly, they foster a strong sense of purpose with contributions from teachers that include analysis of student and teacher information in order to inform decisions. And thirdly, they monitor and support the quality of content of collaborative learning opportunities following a logical continuum. I'd like to elaborate on each of these three things just a bit more. While it's common for educators to sometimes work independently, ensuring collaborative opportunities and working and learning together strengthens teacher capacity. This has the most positive impact on classroom instruction and student learning when leaders are intentional, strategic, and provide both structure and clear expectations. Student learning evidence should always drive next steps for, to help teachers to make instructional adjustments. This is especially true this year with so many new tools, platforms, and resources being introduced to teachers as they navigate through virtual instruction. Teacher leaders and principals should plan collaborative teacher meetings together 
including dates, and times, and norms, and what teachers will be doing during those meetings. This year, teachers will need collaboration and guidance and support around things like transforming lessons from in-person to virtual, building success criteria in a virtual setting, providing appropriate meaningful feedback outside of a face-to-face -face environment, and how to engage students in a virtual learning environment. The value of these collaborative learning opportunities provided to teachers should always be measured by the evidence of student learning, thus spotlighting the need for common understanding of student progress and tracking measures. The most effective opportunity should focus on a clearly established student need, some clear appropriate new learning, the opportunity for participant development of the new learning, for application in their daily work, and the opportunity for participants to measure impact based on student learning evidence. This is critical whether the collaborative learning opportunity is face-to-face -face or virtual. These targeted opportunities for teachers need to be led and facilitated by the person in your building or district with the most expertise in the area. This may or may not be the building level principal and certainly could be a teacher leader. Teachers need to see what is expected of them being modeled in an authentic, real-time setting. Another thing that effective principals do to strengthen capacity is to foster a strong sense of purpose with contributions from teachers that include the analysis of student and teacher information to inform decisions. Things to consider might be involving members of your leadership team in a virtual or face-to-face -face learning walk that's strategic, purposeful, and focuses on student engagement and academic by feedback by teachers to students. During these learning walks, it is important to maintain a focus on the students and what they are learning. Samples of student work could be collected, analyzed in collaborative meetings, and used to plan next steps in teacher learning to move student achievement forward. These artifacts could also be used in one-on-one -on -one coaching situations with teachers, planning sessions, or individual growth plans for teachers, setting up possible field testing of needed strategies for future professional development, and observation post-conferences. Seeking contributions from teachers that are purposeful in regards to appropriate use of new tools and resources could involve peer observations as well. Rather than sending a teacher to observe another teacher, I suggest that you go with them, watch what they watch, hear what they hear, and see what they see, and ask strategic questions like, why do you think she did that? Or what would have happened if she wouldn't have done that? Or what do you think he might do next? And my favorite, what makes you say that? Keep in mind that purposeful peer observations and coaching can happen virtually as well as face to face. If you are not able to go with the teacher to observe, it is important that you set the purpose by giving them specific things to look for and follow up with a coaching session. The most important thing is that we focus on student learning and not only what the teacher is doing, just like in the learning walks. And again, this is critical, whether virtual or face-to-face. -face. And finally, effective principals monitor and support the quality of content of collaborative learning opportunities following a logical continuum. Strong principals do indeed spend time working with teacher leaders to plan collaborative professional development opportunities for teachers and attend them regularly themselves to engage with teachers as they collaborate. Student work and data should always drive small or large group teacher planning and collaborative sessions. As a principal, you should evaluate student artifacts alongside the teachers and work with them to analyze root causes and determine instructional next steps. Collaboration is not only grounded in pedagogy and planning for instruction, but also in evaluating how students are learning and how to address students who need enrichment or reinforcement. As the principal, you should ask, what are our next steps for students who have learned this skill? And what are our next steps for the students who have not learned it? 
Questions like these drive the quality of teacher collaboration and keep everyone focused on not only the teacher actions, but also the student learning as well. For this to happen, you as the principal need to make sure that you have a handle on student progress and tracking measures and build the capacity in your teachers to do the same. Keep in mind that all of the collaborative learning opportunities we talked about today need to follow a logical continuum that targets a clearly identified student or teacher need based on significant student and teacher data consistently being analyzed. Principals and their leadership teams need to select appropriate strategies or processes that are research-based and field-tested with their own students, adjusted appropriately based on impact, and then collaboratively shared as new learning with teachers. Teachers should be given time to develop this new learning within the context of their own teaching assignments and then apply it in their own classrooms with guidance and support from principals and members of the leadership team. This guidance and support could include modeling, team teaching, or possibly observations with appropriate feedback. Teachers should then look collaboratively at samples of student work, measure the impact of the new learning based on evidence from those samples, and make adjustments to their instruction accordingly. As mentioned earlier, effective principals are intentional about providing opportunities for educators to work alongside one another. Collaborative efforts amongst teachers not only positively impact the teachers, but also the students and administrators themselves. Collaboration allows teachers to share best practices that make the biggest impact on student learning and can in turn lead to the entire school utilizing these shared best practices in order to get desired results for students. When educators are collaborating around the right things, it creates a campus culture that leads to student learning being at the forefront of every conversation and instructional decision. Opportunities for educators to collaborate promotes a growth mindset for teachers and facilitates collective efficacy in the school. And remember, don't forget or overlook your own needs as a school leader for collaborative learning opportunities and for obtaining the right tools that you need to be an effective education former. Ask yourself, what do I need from those who grow and support me? What can my supervisor do that will make me more efficient and more effective? Then communicate those needs. Ask your supervisor to be at your school more frequently as a visible supporter and partner in the work. Call on your supervisor to model reflective practices with you and to strengthen your reflection skills. Ask your supervisor to establish collaborative learning opportunities for all principals in the district so that you can grow together just as you expect your teachers to articulate their needs and to learn with and from you so too should you articulate your needs and express the willingness to learn with and from your supervisor. In reflecting over the last few minutes in relation to building teacher capacity through collaborative learning opportunities, what might be something that you need to stop, start, or continue doing? In other words, what should you stop doing in your present role? Ask yourself, what are the things that I've been doing because they're safe or comfortable and keep me in my comfort zone? Ask what should I start doing to further build capacity in my teachers? Ask yourself what are some risky actions that would strengthen me as an instructional leader in this area and take me beyond my comfort zone? And thirdly, what should I continue to do in my role to support teacher leaders and teachers? What can I continue to do to make sure that teachers have the appropriate tools and resources and are using them effectively to increase student achievement? I'd like to close our talk today with something from John Hattie, the author of Visible Learning. And that is, strong leaders and teachers build collective efficacy in their schools through collaborative conversations based on evidence of student learning. And this, my friends, does not happen by accident. Good luck, stay safe, and have a great year. Thank you.